Of course, if I deform a body, which originally has some volume, at the end of the deformation, the volume occupied by this volume, by this body, could be different. So deformation, deformation, at least the strain rather than deformation, involves change of volume. Right? So where is this information? Where is the information that tells me how much has the volume associated to every particle changed, has changed along this process? In the strain. It should be there. How? Let's see. And that's the derivation, by the way, quite curious and quite interesting. I think uh, it's quite interesting to, to see how, how is this derived in very simple, very elegant. Huh? Look, I consider particle P at the reference configuration. And now, now I need to associate some volume to this particle. How do I do that? OK, I consider three neighbor particles, Q, R, and S, defining a parallel pipe, pipe an, an, an orthogonal uh, par a parallelogram, parallel pipe, uh, in, in, uh, around P. So P, Q, R, and S are in orthogonal directions. And now, I said, what is the volume, the differential of volume associated with this particle is the area of this of this parallelogram. The point is, how do I compute this, the, you know, the volume, sorry. How do I compute this volume? Well, there is a very simple mathematical formula that maybe you didn't know that says that if I want to compute the area of this differential element here, I, have, I just have to multiply the vectors of the three edge, edges, PQ, PR, PS. So if we, I multiply this differential of x1, vector product differential of x2. That is what? The product of two vectors, the vector product of two vectors is a vector. Mm -hmm. And now the resulting vector, I multiply that product by the third. Okay? The result is precisely the value. By the way, an operational way of doing this op operation is by doing a determinant. If we place the first vector in the first row, the second vector and the first row, the second row, and the third vector in the third row, I obtain a matrix, okay, sort of matrix. I can take the determinant of that, so if I do the determinant of that, then I obtain that operation, so the differential of volume, okay? So, in other words, the differential of volume of this differential of volume at the reference configuration is just obtained by the determinant of this matrix, which whose component ij, the component ij of this matrix, is the component j of vector i, i standing for 1 to 3. It's just, just taken how this matrix is constructed. OK, so far math mathematics. Now let's consider what happens with this differential of volume when body deforms. So particle p part passes to particle p prime, position p prime, particle q passes to position q prime, Particle R passes to particle 3 prime. That is no longer a parallelepipede. <coughs> that is not, I mean, the formation says that this is no longer a parallelepipede. So the angles, differential of H1, differential, the, the vectors X2, X3 are no longer um, <laughs> orthogonal. But again, the volume of this parallel parallelepipede can be obtained by the triple product, differential of X1, differential of X2, differential of X3. So this formula is not restricted to parallelepipeds, but just to, to oblique uh, uh, parallelepipeds. Okay? So finally, if I then want to compute what is the volume associated to that particle at the current time t, it's just the tri triple product that, which in turn can be expressed by placing the draws of the components of the vectors in here and then doing the determinant. So it's the determinant of a matrix M whose components are that. Okay? Well, so far, it's pure mathematics. But now, in fact, I have some information that says, well, that vector is related to that vector through the gradient of the formation tensor. So I replace, I replace the vectors, differential of S1, X2, and 3, times F, differential of capital X1, capital X2, capital X3. So finally, I just can replace that, and I find that the matrix M 
that was used here to compute the whose determinant provides the volume Bt is related to the matrix capital M with this simple formula. Small m is capital M times F transposed. Okay? Now, let's compute the differential of volume associated to this particle at the current time t, differential of Bt. Is the determinant of M. In turn, the determinant of M times F transposed. You know the determinant of the product of matrices is the product of determinants. So that is the determinant of F than the determinant of, me, of M. But the determinant of capital M was the original volume. So finally, we take this simple formula, very, very used. Not important, because it's a mathematical formula, but it's very used, very, very uh, useful. So that says that the following. If I have a particle which moves and suffers a certain deformation, characterized by a grain of the formation tensor. The change of volume associated to this particle is in where? Are the, where it should be. It's in the, in the deformation tensor. But what informs of that is just the determinant, the determinant in scalar, the determinant of the grain of the formation tensor. Is it? OK? The determinant of the grain of the formation tensor. By the way, <coughs> that determinant, that determinant is something that we call in the first chapter the Jacobian of the deformation. And we required, I said, well, in order to the equations of motion univocally define a one by one univoc relation between particles before and particles, the determinant of this should be different from zero. That's what I said. But that I said. Look, on top of that, not only that, for being physically meaningful, that determinant should be a strictly greater than zero. Now we can see a reason for that. Look, what would happen if this determinant f, which is called j, determinant of a equal j, was smaller than zero? What would happen with this volume? Well, there would be, there would be negative. <laughs> so if that is ne this is positive, so if this is positive. And this is negative, this is negative. What is the physical sense of that? We'll go back to that. We said that this would imply that the density becomes negative, which is not meaningful. So this is now the justification that why you cannot invent any equations of motion representing a physical movement. They should at least fulfill the condition that the determinant of the resulting grain of the formation tensor has to be positive.